There was no pain. There was no struggle. It was peaceful. It was the kind of death that all of us might wish for. The Completed Life Initiative presents... Voices of the Completed Life. In each episode, we share unprecedented conversations at the heart of the human experience. Our hosts dive into honest dialogue about mortality, loss, and grief, as we hear firsthand from individuals who seek to avoid life-limiting maladies in a body that may no longer serve them, and who instead aim to celebrate their lives as completed. These are stories that may challenge and surprise you. These stories are worth listening to. These are Voices of the Completed Life. Our host for this episode, Dr. Lewis Cohen, MD, is an advisor to the Completed Life Initiative who brings expertise in the psychiatric aspects of -of end-of-life care. Recipient of the Eleanor and Thomas Hackett Memorial Lifetime Achievement Award, as well as numerous honors for his writing, Dr. Cohen is completing his third nonfiction book for the public, Winter's End, about a young man with Alzheimer's who hastened his death. This episode is the first part of the story of Gail Garlock, a man diagnosed with Lewy body dementia who legally accessed medical aid in dying in Canada. We spoke to Gail's wife, Barbara, as well as Gail's maid provider, Dr. Stephanie Green. This first part of the story will focus on Gail's background and the legal, clinical, and ethical challenges he faced in accessing maid with a dementia diagnosis. We will hear the first-hand accounts of Barbara and Dr. Green who were present on the day of Gail's chosen death in 2019. We now return to Lou Cohen's conversation with Barbara. So, um, let us begin. um, And let us begin um, with a story where you think we should begin. Well, my name is Barbara Garlock. My husband's name was Gail Garlock. Gail was a kind, respectful unpretentious man. He was fun. He had a wacky sense of humor. He loved bad puns, and we kind of got used to that. Gail was the favorite dad in the neighborhood. On most weekday nights, he'd take a carload of neighborhood kids, including our sons, over to the recreational facility at the university. And he would run, and the kids would play, and he'd he just did this. He he enjoyed our children, of course, but he, he liked kids. He liked to play. He knew how to play. On Sunday mornings, he did the same thing so I could sleep in. He was considerate of me in that way. But that that's sort of what Gail was like. He was, he was fun. He did things for himself, of course, but for others. But he really enjoyed kids and spent time with them. He had all the time in the world for our sons. An example of that, one of our sons wanted to read the Hardy Boy books. It was a television series at the time, but the books were still a little too hard for him. So Gail read aloud 34 Hardy Boy books. (laughs) Only a saint or a very devoted dad would do that. But he was hoping to pass on his love of books and of reading to his children. He had a PhD in English literature, his love of reading and books. He wasn't able to get a job as an English professor, which is what he would have chosen if he could. So he went to library school, so he'd be at least able to work in a university setting. His first professional job was a librarian at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And then in 1985, he was offered what in Canada was the best job for the kind of librarian he was. And that was as collections librarian at the University of Toronto. So his professionally, he was a librarian, 
but he was a little unique because he had that PhD in English literature. And so when professors would come and want more money for their department, well, they had to call him Dr. Garlock. He was an equal in that regard. He was a partner in our marriage. He would change diapers. We prepared meals together. We cleaned the house together. He always did the bathrooms, which I appreciated. <laughs> he did what needed to be done. And, and that was probably true right to the end. So where does Dr. Stephanie Green come into the picture? Well, I have to give a little background because by an enormous coincidence, we happen to know something that only a handful of people knew. In October 2017, a woman named Mary Wilson had a medically assisted death. We had been acquainted with her for about 15 years. We'd been in, introduced by a mutual friend. During the time we knew her, she developed Alzheimer's disease. Her doctors took a huge chance when they gave her a medically assisted death because her only diagnosis was dementia. For that reason, there was no public acknowledgement whatsoever of the circumstances of Mary's death. However, Mary's husband told my friend about the circumstances of her death, and my friend told me. None of this information was public, but Gail and I happened to know it because of that enormous coincidence that we had once known Mary Wilson. And so in March 2018, about five months after Barry's death, we made an appointment to see Stephanie Green. My name is Stephanie Green. I'm co-founder and president of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers. I met Gail Garlock in 2018, I believe, and he'd come to see me uh, with his wife, Barbara, to talk to me about the possibilities of applying for an assisted death. Uh, it was at a time when in Canada, we'd only had assisted dying legalized uh, since uh, June of 2016. So it was less than two years fresh. And so Gail and Barbara came to see me at a time when there was little to no experience with considering patients with dementia for assisted dying. Uh, there was an underlying current of thought that if someone had dementia, they probably couldn't apply for MAID, they wouldn't ever be found eligible, that they couldn't meet the eligibility criteria. And as we spent the first one or two years really trying to learn the system, learn the, what the legislation said, learn how to apply it, learn how to care for our patients, um, something like a patient with dementia seemed a little bit further out of scope, and we hadn't spent a lot of time trying to uh, consider that situation. But by the time Gail came to see me, it had been on my mind for some time. Previous to meeting Gail, I had met a woman named Mary Wilson, whose story is well known and, and publicized through the, our national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. And Mary had come to see me purely because of her diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And I got to a point in my evaluation of Mary where I did feel that she was qualified for assisted dying, but I wasn't prepared personally to take the risk in case I was wrong. Uh, it was very, very new. We were only about a year into the law, and I felt that if I had made a misrepresentation or misinterpretation that I would face personal consequences, legal ones, which I wasn't willing to risk at that time. Which is a point that I should sort of interrupt you and just make it emphatic that you are talking about Canadian law. Um, the, the two cases that you're going to be describing, starting with Mary Wilson, um, are involved Canadian citizens. Um, you are a Canadian. And that we have a very different situation uh, here in the United States in that none of the states that have approved medical assistance in dying here in the United States at this point would accept anyone who had a dementing illness. But having said that and explained that now, when I saw Mary Wilson, when Mary came to see me uh, about her diagnosis of dementia, I was the first person to approach me uh, to see if they could qualify for an assisted death under Canadian law, which did not require terminal illness. And I had never really considered 
whether a patient with dementia might qualify because there was um there there are a number of criteria that must be met but two of them seemed to be in conflict with patients with dementia uh there are, like i said there are a number of criteria one of which is that the patient must have capacity to understand what they're asking and the ramifications of if they proceed with assisted dying and another criteria is that they need to have what we call a grievous and irremediable condition which on the surface sounds like dementia might qualify for but we define a grievous and irremediable condition to include a number of subconditions and one of those subconditions is that the patient is in what we call an advanced state of decline and so the question of course in 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 my mind was could a patient with dementia be both in an advanced state of decline and still have capacity that on first blush seemed to be not really possible and so it took a lot of discussion and conversation with colleagues with scholars with academics with clinicians uh, with patients with myself to to try to come to terms with what those criteria meant and what they didn't mean and whether it was ever really possible to find uh a a a patient eligible with both of those things at the same time and with mary i did feel that those things were both true and i did feel that she was eligible for care but because it was so early on in our journey with assisted dying you know i had no precedent for knowing whether the judiciary would be okay with that whether people would come after me to prosecute me and challenge that decision and i quite honestly didn't feel up to stepping forward uh to take that risk personally at that time and it's not something i'm especially proud of or not proud of it was just the state of where i was at in my practice at the time and i i explained to the family what their options were uh whether they could challenge the law in court whether they could walk away whether we could seek another opinion and we went through a variety of options and in the end i referred them i i didn't refer them actually i suggested they think about uh, what their options would be and what would be best for them and they found another clinician who was uh willing to assess her case uh, did also find her eligible and in the end went ahead and proceeded with that assisted death um which was then of course reviewed by our regulating body at length in depth and over a significant period of time which i think was difficult for the other clinicians involved uh but uh importantly uh the decision came out from that regulating body which is not a public decision i haven't read all the details but concluded that the case was done professionally professionally uh and within the bounds of the law and clearly didn't mean to be a precedent in any way was it was a decision based on one case only but uh clearly was a precedent that this could happen mary had no other physical illness wrong with her it was an application based entirely on her cognitive decline and clearly there was a way in at least one case where this could uh be found legally eligible for assisted dying in Canada and i think it opened the door for other clinicians like myself to feel slightly more confident in assessing other patients who may or may not uh, be also found eligible and that was the context uh that was in my mind when i was approached by Gail Garlock to consider whether he might uh be eligible for assisted dying could you tell us about Gail's illness and the impact that it had Gail was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia in 2014 for a few years our lives continued much the same only slower but early 2018 things were getting hard he lost the ability to read and that had been one of his great joys one of his reasons for being I would read to him uh novels at that point were too long and complicated but um I would read short stories or magazine articles eventually even that was too difficult for him when short stories and magazine articles became too difficult then I would read single poems to him I'd read the poems slowly and several times and we would talk about the rich language the imagery and when he was a student <laughs> we used to do that together when he would try to explain poems to me but in terms of his loss of the ability to read for him that was that was huge and the other effects of the lewy body dementia included what gail gradually withdrew 
from socialization because he was embarrassed. The processing was still there in early 2018, but it was slower. So if he was in a conversation with several people, he might respond to something that was spoken three minutes earlier. His brain just couldn't keep up. So he withdrew. And Barbara, were there physical symptoms as part of his illness? Yes, Lewy body dementia is related to Parkinson's. So although he never developed a tremor or a noticeable tremor, other physical aspects of Parkinson's disease were beginning to show. His feet would shuffle when he walked. This was a man who ran the Boston Marathon when he was 61 years old in 2005. And by 2018, we could walk around the block together. That was about as far as he could go. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were also difficulties he had with, and his blood pressure <laughs> had never before been a problem. But once he was on the medications that are often used with Parkinson's, his blood pressure became low. And so upon standing, he would often be very dizzy. And that led to some falls. One of those falls in June of 2019 really contributed greatly to his demise. So tell us about Gail Garlock and that initial approach. So Gail and his wife Barbara came to see me about the possibility of whether he would be eligible for an assisted death. Uh, he had been diagnosed already with Lewy body dementia. He understood very well what that meant. Uh, he was already in some, some decline. Uh, he had witnessed the decline and death of his mother-in-law from dementia a decade earlier. And as I came to understand uh, who Gail was, he was a man who loved academics and reading and books and family and community. And his mind was a very precious resource for him. And it was very upsetting to him that he was beginning to go down this decline and knew where he was going. And he didn't come to see me seeking an assisted death at this exact time. He wanted to know whether it might be possible in the future when and if he ever found himself in a situation that he felt he was suffering intolerably, that he could no longer exist or go on in the state that he might find himself. He was really looking for information about whether that might be possible in the future should he ever get there. So it was an information session, really. And intolerable suffering is really a major criteria that you're looking for when you're evaluating people. And he was saying, not now, but maybe in the future, um, I will be in that position. Exactly. So intolerable suffering is one of the criteria that makes up our definition of a grievous and irremediable condition. The patient needs to have a serious illness, disease, or disability. They must be in an advanced state of decline in capability, and they must be suffering intolerably in a way that cannot be relieved uh, that's acceptable to the patient. So those three things have to all be true in order to say the patient has a grievous and irremediable condition. And of course, that makes sense to our patients because nobody I've met wants to proceed with an assisted death unless they're suffering intolerably. Uh, and Gail was not yet doing so. If you wouldn't mind, paint me a visual picture of um, your first meeting with Gail. So my office is at the end of a very long hallway. And uh, as I was awaiting Gail's arrival, I opened the door. I often keep my office door open and I peered out and I saw him and Barbara uh, coming down the hallway. Gail was walking independently. Uh, he didn't have a walker or a cane at that time, but he was walking slowly with a slight shuffle uh, and uh, holding on to the arm of Barbara. Uh, and he did walk uh, that entire length of the hallway on his own, uh, came in, introduced himself, and, and sat down. He was slightly stooped at that time, not much, and, uh, and grateful for my time to meet with him. So this man being able to at least walk down the hall, um, that said to you, he may have a Parkinson-like disease, but so far he is not entirely crippled by it. Exactly. Watching Gail walk down that hallway confirmed to me that something was wrong, that he had the beginnings of a significant disease, but he was not yet at the end of his disease. And you were yourself 
still in a period of uncertainty as to um, what kind of role you might take with somebody who came to you um, with an underlying dementia. Actually, when I first met Gail, um, I was thinking of my experience with Mary Wilson, the conclusion of which had not yet been completed. I, I did not know the outcome, the final outcome of that case yet, or what the regulating body uh, would conclude. So when I met Gail, I was willing to have the conversation with him. I wanted to explain the complexity of his application, make sure that he fully understood all of his options, which might include an assisted death, but might also not include an assisted death, that he was well informed about palliative care, uh, other care sources, resources, uh, potential challenges uh, to the law, uh, that he had a full understanding of uh, what his options were. Okay. And, 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 I, and that I, I certainly did not guarantee him any sort of outcome of where our meeting would end up or what my assessment of his situation would be, but that I would be willing to continue a conversation with him about it. Yeah. And again, unfortunately, if he had been an American citizen, if you, in fact, were an American doctor practicing in one of the states uh, that does permit medical assistance in dying, that conversation would have taken the form of you, you know, giving him the bad news, which is no matter what he decides in the future, uh, unless he comes down with some other illness, um, medical assistance in dying was not going to be an option. That is correct. If, if I was in the United States or Gail was a U.S. citizen, uh, I would have been forced to tell him that unless he came down with another medical or physical illness, that he would not qualify for assisted dying. You're listening to Voices of the Completed Life, a podcast brought to you by the Completed Life Initiative. Learn more about the Completed Life Initiative and donate to our cause at www.completedlife.org. We provide groundbreaking presentations about the right to control one's own end-of-life experience. We explore legislative options for expanding the eligibility criteria for medical aid in dying within the United States and look to other countries around the globe in support of the right to die. We empower people to ask, what does it mean to live a completed life? Spread the word about the completed life on social media by using hashtag completed life. And now, back to our episode. Stephanie pretended to know nothing about Mary Wilson. She was protecting the doctors involved. Stephanie agreed that Gail was still mentally capable, despite his dementia diagnosis, but she could not approve his application for a medically assisted death because of his dementia diagnosis. I think also she believed he was not suffering intolerably and she probably thought he was not yet in an advanced state of decline. Both of those are conditions necessary in Canada to have a medically assisted death. We have three sons and the day after our appointment with Stephanie, we told them what that appointment had been about. They were not wildly surprised. They voiced concerns, but they were supportive. They live in Toronto. We live in Victoria. So this had to be done over the phone. They understood that the quality of life was what mattered to Gail and that his quality of life would gradually disappear. By early 2019, everything was becoming much more difficult. Stephanie had agreed to stay in touch with us occasionally, and that was usually by email. But And I did let her know that I was concerned that Gail was gradually losing capability. I told her that his walking, he could walk very short distances. He certainly was not safe walking alone. By then... He had no independence whatsoever. He could still use a fork. He could no longer cut, cut with a knife. His mental processing had slowed greatly. And then, late in March 2019, we received a phone call from Stephanie Green, and that was unusual. So during that time that we stayed in touch, I, of course, became aware that Gail was continuing to decline, as was expected. 
What also happened during that time was the resolution of the story of Mary Wilson's experience and my understanding that nothing nefarious had happened and the regulatory body was in agreement that um, her assisted death had been carried out professionally and legally. I felt that it was important to inform Gail and Barbara about that and my new understanding of what that might imply for them. And so I reached out to them to let them know that I would uh, be willing to offer an assisted death to Gail if he did eventually meet all the criteria. Uh, and I felt uh, that it was appropriate to do so. She said that she would not contact us again about this that we would have to contact her if Gail wanted to continue. And I realized that I could have no part in influencing Gail's decision. So for the next mm, 10 days or so, we talked about it very little. And one day at, at lunch, out of the blue, Gail said, I will go ahead with Maid. Mm. We made an appointment with Stephanie for that May, early May, I believe. Watching Gail and Barbara arrive for that meeting that spring uh, was a different picture. Uh, Gail was using a walker at that point, and he was moving much more slowly. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with him privately, which I always did every time I met with him or spoke with him. And I spent time speaking with both Gail and, and Barbara together. And at that time, Gail was still very much aware of what was wrong with him. Uh, he had insight into his inability to speak fluently. We were able to take enough time so that he was able to get his point across. Gail certainly was still processing and thinking uh, quite clearly, but had many more challenges in uh, finding the words that he wanted to use. It was clear to me during that appointment that he had the capacity to still understand what was wrong with him. He understood he had dementia that was progressing. He understood he was losing his ability to speak. He was very aware of his compounding losses. He couldn't physically play with his grandchildren. He couldn't even keep up with the conversation with them because his thinking had slowed to the point that if he wanted to add something to a comment, he would already be two comments behind. Uh, he withdrew from social situations because of that. Uh, he was really struggling and clearly suffering more than the first time I saw him. By the end of that interview with Gail, it was clear to me that he actually had met all of the criteria necessary for an assisted death. And I told him and Barbara that if he ever felt his suffering was truly intolerable, that I would be willing to offer them an assisted death. Yeah. I remember after that meeting with her, we walked out to the car. We were both dazed. We couldn't believe that this had happened, that something that had been impossible a year before was now possible. We sat in the car probably for five minutes just breathing because it was such a shock to us that he had been approved. However, Gail did say that he wanted to wait until our family vacation that we always had in late August. We would always go to Ontario and spend time on a lake with all of our sons and grandsons. So he wanted to wait until late August, and then he would have a medically assisted death. On June 14th, Gail fell. He was in the bathroom. I saw him fall. It was a very very hard fall, but his head did not hit the floor and he did not lose consciousness. However, he was very disoriented. He couldn't coordinate his body enough to stand or even to crawl. And so somehow I got him to sit on the bath mat in the bathroom and I pulled it like a sled across the bathroom floor, through the doorway and into our bedroom. I truly don't know how I got him into bed. After that fall, he was mostly bedridden or wheelchair bound or seated in a chair. That fall was a turning point. He realized there'd be no end of August vacation with our family. 
He also realized that a long-term care facility would happen sooner rather than later if he didn't have a medically assisted death. And so on July 3rd, about three weeks after that fall, he said he would go ahead with MAID. And I made an appointment with Stephanie for July 18th. On July 9th, Gail woke up from a nap. He told me he thought he'd chipped a tooth and asked me to make an appointment with the dentist, who fortunately could see us that later that day at six o'clock. When I told Gail about that appointment, looking me straight in the face, he said, you need to tell my wife about that appointment. Uh, I was absolutely floored. I tried to stay calm. I said something like, I'll be sure to tell her. This had been the first time that he had not known me. After he fell back asleep, I went out into the living room and just sobbed because I believed that he had lost capacity. And and for the next, I don't know, week or until we saw Stephanie on July 18th, I believe uh, there were no more incidents when he didn't know me. At our appointment on July 18th with Stephanie Green, I was never in the room with Stephanie and Gail when they met. I was always in another room. But Gail told her about that July 9th incident when he hadn't known me. After we saw Stephanie Green in the following month and a half, there were times when he didn't know me, but it always came back. And that's what Stephanie did explain to me. Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, two of the criteria that need to both be true uh, it, to be found eligible for an assisted death in Canada, two of the many criteria, are that the patient must have capacity to make this healthcare decision for themselves, to demonstrate understanding of what's wrong with them and what their choice entails. And at the same time, they need to already be in an advanced state of decline and capability. So in a patient with dementia or cognitive decline, the question is, how can those things both be true at the same time? The understanding is that if you're already in an advanced state of decline, you've probably lost capacity to make your healthcare care decisions. So how can that ever be true? Um, and that was a question that we grappled with uh, in the early days. We did look to learn from our colleagues uh, in Europe, in particular in the Netherlands, where they have a model of care, a model approach to these situations that, that we call 10 minutes to midnight. In this metaphor, uh, midnight represents the loss of capacity to make your own healthcare decisions, the loss of, of capacity. And uh, I should point out that in medicine, uh, many of your listeners might know that capacity um, is what we call task specific. You may not be able to balance your checkbook, but you may still have capacity to make a decision about certain healthcare matters. So uh, the question here is whether the patient has the capacity to ask for an assisted death. And I would just mention that capacity involves an understanding of illness, an understanding of treatment options, to weigh the pros and cons about them, to appreciate what they're asking for and what the ramifications of proceeding would be, and to articulate a request. All of those things need to be true to kind of encompass capacity. So midnight represents the time when capacity to make your own healthcare decisions might be lost. I think there's a misunderstanding out there that capacity is a flick of a switch and comes and goes at a moment in time. And that's not really true. Capacity can fluctuate. Uh, it can be reversible at times. But for people with cognitive decline, with dementia, we know that there's a trend and that eventually capacity will be lost, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly over time. It's not an exact point. But on our metaphor, midnight would represent a time after which capacity is lost. The model of care goes that if I'm able to meet someone earlier on in their diagnosis, when they are maybe early, just diagnosed with dementia, and I get to know them and what their wishes are and what their values are and what brings meaning and joy to their life and what it is that they're fearful of and what it is they are hoping to avoid and why they're asking for an assisted death eventually and 
and how that may or may not happen. As I get to know them and follow them regularly through time, maybe every six months, maybe every three months, eventually every two or one month, as I go around the clock fakes and we get close to midnight as they're declining and they're soon to be losing capacity, there may in fact come a time, a time what I might call 10 minutes to midnight, when I might be able to say to the patient, you know, six months from now, I'm not certain you'll still have capacity to make all of your own decisions. Uh, you've been talking to me for X many months or years about this moment. I wanted to tell you that this is where we're at. And we can have a conversation. At that time, I would say there's a lot of things that people disagree with about assisted dying. But one thing that almost everybody can agree upon is that the loss of capacity to make your own healthcare decisions is, in fact, an advanced state of decline in capability. I think nobody would argue that. What this model of care suggests is that if you are very close to that time, if your loss of capacity is imminent, if in my medical opinion, somewhere in the next three to six months, it is likely that you will lose capacity to make your own healthcare decisions, I would argue that that is already an advanced state of decline. That imminency is an advanced state of decline. And if you believe that is true, which I believe, then I believe there's a small window in those 10 minutes to midnight where a patient can already be in an advanced state of decline but still have capacity to make this decision and therefore meet all the criteria of our law. At that July 18th meeting, Gail had told her about not knowing me. We had always been completely open and honest with her because she was taking a risk for us. But she assured me that when she saw him on July 18th, because she had to, again, assess his capability, she assured me that he was capable, that he he understood what he was asking for, and he understood that he would die at the end of the procedure. Gail had to have two more assessments after that one, when Stephanie once again approved him to have a medically assisted death. One of those assessments was with his neurologist. The second was with another maid provider. And both of them found him capable. Normally in Canada, when there is a medically assisted death, two different maid, two different doctors must assess the patient for capability. That would be the usual procedure. But because of Gail's dementia diagnosis, and because this was on the edge, Stephanie Green wanted his neurologist to also assess his capability. So that happened. Uh, his neurologist saw him at the end of July. The second maid provider saw him at the middle of August. And at that point, a date was set for Gail's death, which was on August 26th. Can you tell us, and I'm, I'm sorry to go probing into what has to be a painful, um, a complicated memory. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes. Um, we knew that Stephanie was coming to the house at around one o'clock. At 12.30 or so, Gail woke from his nap and he knew what was going to happen. We talked, we, we told each other we loved one another in every way we knew how. We told each other we were grateful to have shared our lives together. Stephanie arrived. Uh, as is usual in my practice, I go to the pharmacy and I pick up the medications. Uh, and then I traveled to his home. Uh, I arrived at his home with an IV nurse uh, who I always work with. And we introduced ourselves uh, to the people who were there. And in fact, there was Gail, Barbara, and his three children who I had not met previously. Um, as is my custom, when I first come in, I take private time with the patient. So I was able to go into the bedroom and speak with Gail alone and privately for uh, a period of time. And I used that time 
to make sure that there's been no change of plan, that uh, Gail is very aware of what's going on, that he still has capacity to make this decision, that he wants to proceed uh, and answer any questions that he might have. To be honest, I really value that private time with patients. I find it's a very honest conversation. It's very raw. Uh, there's really not a lot of uh, need for beating around the bush. Gail confirmed to me that he was absolutely certain about his decision. Uh, it was clear to me during that meeting that he knew who I was and why I was there. And he was able to ask me again for an assisted death. Um, I was able to be absolutely certain that he had capacity to make this decision and understood the ramifications of his decision. After that conversation, I asked my nurse to start his IV while I was talking to his family members in another room. And he was very aware of what I was talking to them about and had given me permission to do so. Uh, and in the other room, I spoke with, with Barbara and the children about exactly what would happen, the order of events, what they might expect to see, uh, and answered any and all of their questions. I find it's important to work transparently uh, and to leave uh, nothing unturned. He could have changed his mind at any time. After Stephanie had spoken with Gail, um, all of us, meaning my three sons were there, and me, of course, went into the bedroom. I crawled into bed next to Gail. Our, our sons were at the foot of the bed, touching him. They told him what a wonderful father he had been. What a wonderful role model he had been for them. I was lying next to him, just whispering, I love you, repeatedly. It, it was all I could manage to do. I always ensure that there's time for final goodbyes and final words, uh, which we shared together. I was quite supportive, very beautiful, actually, to hear his children speak to him and thank him for what he had given them, for being an exceptional role model as a father, uh, for them to tell him that they loved him and they would miss him, but that they understood why he was making this decision. That was important to Gail. He didn't want to hurt his children. He wanted them very much to understand why he was making this decision and to have their support. Uh, and I was very happy for him to be able to have his immediate family with him uh, for this process at that time to support him. It was very evident to me that the people in the room had put their own wishes and needs to the side in order to support Gail's wishes and needs on that day. Uh, it was very moving to see that uh, expressed and quite a privilege to be involved in that intimate scene with this family. Once final words were shared, and, and of course I always give the last word to the patient, so Gail had the last word. Uh, once that was complete, um, I asked Gail the most important question of the day, which was whether he was ready to begin. Uh, and he looked at me and said, yes, he wanted to proceed. And at that point, I picked up my medication and began to administer it. There was no pain. There was no struggle. It was peaceful. It was the kind of death that all of us might wish for. It took maybe a total of 10 minutes for him to finally stop breathing. And what took place with you, with your sons at that point? We left the room. I, I can only, we all felt like we were in a daze. It was, it was hard to believe that he was gone, but obviously he was. And we were grateful for that because he hadn't had to continue his illness to the very end. But it, all of it, we were hardly able to speak. I think we were mostly dazed. It took, probably took several hours for his death to, to start to sink in. It's obviously a very sad event when somebody's life uh, ends. Uh, and there's no masking that. This was a sad event and a sad day for this family. But I have to say, I also believe uh, it was the fulfillment of Gail's wishes. And I think his family understood that and were grateful uh, for the care that we were able to afford him. Uh, Gail's last words to me were, were of, of gratitude. You had 
entered into this treatment relationship with some trepidation. As you now sort of uh, uh, digest, you've had time to digest uh, what happened. Um, where are you at emotionally? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I think that over time, what happens with practice over time is you you evolve a little bit and you mature in your understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it and how it should be done. And you get better at it, I hope. Um, I feel quite comfortable with what happened uh, with Gail, with, with my ability to provide this care for him. I am quite certain that I worked well within the boundaries of the law. I am quite certain I worked with well within the boundaries of what Gail wished and what the family uh, had hoped for. And in the subsequent years, since we're talking about 2019, we're talking three years ago, how unusual was Gail Garlick for you and for your colleagues? Well, I think it's, it's clear that my experience with Gail is something I'm always going to remember, uh, as he was the first patient in this situation that I was uh, willing and able to help. Um, it gave me some confidence moving forwards, and he's not the last person I've helped in this situation. I would emphasize that not every patient with dementia will qualify for an assisted death. These are complicated cases. They are complex to assess. Uh, many patients with cognitive decline will lose insight into their illness as they progress. They will get to a place where they no longer feel that they're suffering or notice their decline or notice their um, their inabilities and not care as much. And there's some beauty in that for them. Um, so many patients will never ask for an assisted death as they decline with dementia. There are other patients like Gail who are quite clear on what they want, quite adamant, and are able to maintain that insight right up to a point when they are near losing capacity and already in an advanced state of decline and able to look at me and say, I know this is happening. I know what the future brings for me. This is intolerable for me. And I'd like you to assist me now before I get to that place. And if that exists and all the criteria are met, I feel I can help those patients. Gail was the first, but not the last. But again, it's not a lot of people because these are very complicated situations and every case is individual and every case must be evaluated on its own merits, uh, in its own situation, in its, in its own obstacles and, uh, and be taken case by case. I want to add something that I hadn't mentioned before, that, that it was hugely important to Gail that some good come out of this Many people don't want this option. I get that entirely, and I respect their wishes. But for those who want this option, I hope, and he hoped, that it would open the door for them because they would know it was possible, even with a dementia diagnosis. And that's why I've been so public about his medically assisted death. You just heard the story of Gail Garlock, told by his wife Barbara, and his medical aid in dying provider, Dr. Stephanie Green. As Barbara said, it was Gail's wish that his story be told. So we encourage you to share this podcast and continue the conversation in your community. And be sure to listen to the next episode of Voices of the Completed Life for the second part of the Garlock's story. We will hear from Barbara and her son, Jeff, as they discuss the impact that Gail's decision has had on them and their family in the three years since his death. If you would like to share a response to Gail Garlock's story, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media platforms at Completed Life. Additionally, if you are interested in sharing your story of a completed life on this podcast, whether for yourself or a loved one, please reach out to us via email at info at completedlife.org. The goal of this podcast is to share end-of-life stories of all stripes to further weave together our collective understanding of what it means to live a completed life. This has been Voices of the Completed Life. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us at www.completedlife.org. That's completedlife.org. 
where you'll find extensive video content regarding resources on aid in dying, featuring discussions led by expert clinicians, bioethicists, policymakers, and end-of-life doulas. At the Completed Life Initiative, we advocate for a person's right to direct their own end-of-life care. Take control over your transition, your life, your choice.